across the fence, we're on the trail of a beloved but mysterious animal, the catamount. We'll learn about the history of these ferocious felines in the Green Mountains and ask a simple question, are there catamounts in Vermont? Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Catamounts are everywhere in Vermont, on license plates, in the names of businesses, and some of you may even live on Catamount Lane or work at Catamount Park. Vermonters love the catamount, but that's not always been the case. Catamounts haven't lived in Vermont for nearly 140 years, and recently federal authorities have designated these animals as extinct. But Vermonters keep seeing big cats. In fact, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department receives and investigates sightings from all over Vermont every year. So, are catamounts here or not? To begin to uncover this mystery, I'm joined by Across the Fences' Keith Silva. And before I ask you if you've seen a catamount, what got you interested in this story? Judy, I was working on a story about uh, the UVM mascot, uh, mm -hmm. Rally Catamount. At the time, I thought I would do this whole catamount epic. We'd talk about <laughs> real catamounts. Um, and the thing that kicked me off was, at one time, UVM had a real live catamount mascot. His name was Rink. He mm -hmm. lasted about two months because he grew very quickly, uh, but he would growl at the opposing players and, you know, they fed him steaks and, and that sort <laughs> of thing. they don't make good pets. <laughs> <laughs> they do not make good pets, as the couple who owned him from South Burlington learned very quickly. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, uh, I'd interviewed a, a wildlife biologist and I had this really great interview. Uh, and I thought, you know, this is just too much. So I'll stick with I'll stick with the uh, mascot. We'll do the rally cat story, and we'll move this catamount story. Uh, so I started talking to people if they had seen the catamount. And uh, I have to tell you, like, if it's like one degree of separation, yeah. if you haven't seen one, then your brother has, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, so and so. Well, just everybody. before I came in here, I was talking to one of the photographers, and he said, "Oh, my parents saw one on Jay Peak." <laughs> of course, yes, I, yep. <laughs> of course they did. Um, so uh, one of the things that I, I, I learned was that it was going to be hard to do this story right. without any video. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I caught a break when I talked to uh, Mike Kessler, who you know mm -hmm. from the show. Great guy. Yeah, wildlife tracker, favorite of, of the program. Mike had a really personal story that he hadn't really shared with a lot of people yet. So I emailed him and he said, uh, yeah, I'll share it. I'll share it with ATF. And in one way or another, every catamount story is a personal story, and Mike's was no different. But before I could track that down, I had to figure out first what to even call these animals. If you think you've seen a catamount in Vermont, you probably haven't. If you think you've seen a cougar or a mountain lion, well... A little mystery is good in our lives. Scientists call it Felis concolor, cat of one color. This feline may be one color, but it goes by many names. Mountain lion, puma, panther, and cougar. And then there are the subspecies, like the eastern cougar, what's known in Vermont as a catamount. The easiest ways to spot a catamount nowadays is either at a University of Vermont sporting event or in a museum. The last confirmed catamount in Vermont resides at the Vermont Historical Society in Montpelier. It was killed by Alexander Crowell on Thanksgiving Day, 1881. Not only was this animal the last of its kind in Vermont, it was also one of the biggest. They're large cats. The Jed Murdoch is a wildlife biologist and a professor has in the Rubenstein School of Environment of and Natural Resources at UVM. The largest um, catamount or cougar killed on record here in Vermont um, was 182 and a half pounds. It was, in fact, the last one on record killed in Vermont in 1881 in, I think it was Barnard, uh, Vermont. So a pretty good sized cat, I think from nose to tip of tail was about seven feet. You know, this is a large carnivore, uh, and, uh, and they're very secretive, and they're, they tend to be more solitary, unlike coyotes or wolves or, or some of the other uh, carnivores found here in North America. In January 2018, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service changed the status of the eastern cougar, or catamount, from endangered to extinct. The statement reads in part, the best available scientific and commercial information shows no evidence of the existence of either a reproducing population or any individuals. So if you're interested in getting some experience with endangered species, just want to get out. As a teacher and scientist, 
Murdoch is often asked if there's still a chance catamounts could be roaming Vermont's wild places. I guess if you think of it from like an evidence-based point of view, it's hard to really make that argument. Yes, there are lots of sightings that come through, and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department does a great job at investigating, I think, all of those sightings. Um, but there really isn't a lot of hard evidence. And, and given the fact that we've got lots of roads that crisscross through Vermont, we've got people out um, in the wilderness, especially during deer hunting times, uh, we've got lots of trail cams out, lots of ways of monitoring the environment remotely. Um, it would be surprising if they were here and we didn't detect them. Now, I have to say that as soon as I make the statement that the catamounts are not here, one will pop up tomorrow, you know, in the news. <laughs> There's always a chance. There's some uncertainty. This is a needle within a needle within a needle in a big haystack. Mike Kessler is an expert tracker and longtime instructor at UVM. Okay. Following him through the woods is an education. Ooh, I see it. Look at this right here. You can see there's a nice large heel pad print here. One of the best locations Kessler's found for tracking in Vermont is the Jericho Research Forest. Running through the 485 acres that encompass this property is the Millbrook Watershed, which, according to Kessler, Federal biologists consider the highest value wildlife corridor in the Northeast. Kessler's tracked all kinds of animals through these woods, including large cats. Now I have to turn and slink this way. And I'm thinking because when toes are poked through, they have definition that that's, that's clear like that. That's usually an indication there's more time standing in this track. And that's a cougar track is what you're telling me. Yeah, it has no nails anywhere in there. Not a dog, not a bear. Now a huge dog is not gonna move this stealthy, nails are gonna be out. And so it's a preponderance of evidence. It's circumstantial, but we just keep building the case until we find one that's absolutely conclusive. And so, um, so in other words, it's like, would I spend the rest of the day following this one? Sure, yeah, I would invest my my time and energy on this one, as opposed to others that are like, oh, yeah, it could be, but not sure. But when you add all this up, it's, um, yeah, this is what they say, makes sense in the big picture and in the little picture. So we run with it. Not only has Kessler tracked a big cat here in Jericho, he has his own big cat, Tail to Tell. In 2015, Kessler's longtime tracking companion, a corgi named Lucy, died. Kessler figures he and Lucy took over 10,000 walks together, many of them in this area, which is why he chose to bury Lucy in the Jericho Research Forest. Seven months after Lucy's death, Kessler says he got an urge to visit her grave. The night before, she'd been dug up. I found her there cached under debris, something that had a four foot long reach. She was down over two and a half feet under a layer of clay. So there was plenty good tracks there with clay. There was an animal whose rear feet were six feet behind the hole. Dug her up, left her there, and um, there were just mountain lion tracks all over there. As Kessler further investigated the site, he confirmed what he suspected. It wasn't a bear or a bobcat that had dug up Lucy. It was a cat, a big one. Physics gets involved too, not just in making the tracks, which is so you have a force through a form, you need pounds per square inch and you need compaction on the soil, but in digging up a, a grave, the amount of force that had to be generated, aside from the prints that it left in the clay there, but just the force alone to dig through clay down over two feet, there has to be equal and opposite force in the rear feet anchoring it. So. You could see in there how hard that cat was digging and how far that dirt was spread, including Lucy's hair a little bit when it got to it. So those rear feet were anchored for a while there. So it was very easy to see where the rear feet were. The rear feet were that far apart and they were six feet behind the hole. So that's not a, that's not a bobcat again. <laughs> it's not a bobcat and it wasn't a bear because the bear have their claws out and their, their anatomy is totally different than the, the anatomy of a, a mountain lion. A mountain lion in Vermont. 
But how did it get here? And what was it doing in Jericho? Kessler has a theory. About the time he discovered Lucy's disinterred remains, a large interagency drill was taking place about five miles northeast at the Camp Ethan Allen training site. The exercise was teaching emergency responders what to do after a simulated earthquake. It makes sense that if an animal was coming through, it could very well be in there. And if it is in there and that type of activity kicks off, it's gonna get pushed out one way or the other. It's gonna go up Millbrook or down Millbrook and appears to have come down. And on its way down, it would have ended up in the corridor where I buried Lucy. And so from a practical point of view, it's, yeah, you put it all together. It's like, I guess you could call it a perfect tracking storm. After the discovery, Kessler reburied Lucy's remains in another location. When he returned home, he did something unconsciously that would reinforce what he already knew about the presence of big cats in Vermont. I had smelled so bad, I had to just throw away all my clothes and I threw the rake and the shovel up on top of the wood pile just because I didn't want to deal with them. About a month later, Kessler awoke in the middle of the night to an odd sound. It was like the weirdest owl sound I'd ever heard. And then all of a sudden, I hear the sound over there. And I was like, oh, this must be an owl because nothing else would move that quick and that silently. It had to have flown down there. Kessler has a recording of what he heard that night, what he calls a cat bark. But that wasn't all he heard. And all of a sudden I heard a huge stick break. When I heard that stick break, I went right to it. And uh, to my utter surprise was a uh, mountain lion. And we were only 15 yards apart and there was nothing between us. And it was a while, we were there. This whole thing was about 15 minutes. And uh, it, standing in that one place under some pine trees, it left really good tracks there too. That mountain lion had come to my house. I tracked it to my wood pile. It was standing on its rear legs and I didn't understand why. And then I looked on top of the wood pile and there, were those, there was the rake and the shovel. I totally forgot about that. Kessler's story and his tracking expertise gives credence to the presence of cougars in Vermont. If so, it's likely to be a subspecies, the Western cougar, and not the Eastern cougar or catamount. Like many humans who visit Vermont, these Western cougars are probably just passing through, tourists. But what would it mean if one decided to stay? Maybe brought a friend? Could Vermont once again become cat country? The start of a population is always a pair of dispersing individuals. Right? <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's the possibility that more than one could end up here and, and a population could get started. But, you know, you've also got this issue of social caring capacity. Are people here in Vermont willing to accept, uh, you know, a large felid, a large uh, carnivore um, in the landscape? And we made it pretty clear many years ago in the, in the 1800s, really, that we did not want them around. Both wolves and catamounts were driven to extinction through bounties and, and, uh, and other means. Maybe times have changed. I would be thrilled to know that catamounts are here. Um, they're such powerful symbols of wilderness, and to me, knowing that the landscape is in enough of a natural state to be able to support cougars is something that I, I would hold great value towards. Because Vermont lacks large open areas like those out west, Murdoch tempers his enthusiasm for the possible return of big cats to the Green Mountains. Kessler, on the other hand, embraces the mystery. Now what am I gonna do? Then heck, if you're a tracker, you're fueled by mystery. It drives you to get right down on your hands and knees and get dirty and follow things and follow them a long time and look at details that other people would think are silly. And because that's very tactile, that's tangible, that's real. But what drives you to do that is the mystery, the love of the mystery. And you never solve the whole mystery. Whether there are cougars in Vermont or not, or if they're only passing through. Perhaps it's good, there's still a little mystery about that. Well, Mike stopped by while he's editing this story, and Judy, he's found more tracks. All right, stay tuned. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. Thanks for joining us. See you again next time on Across the Fence.
Thank you.